the Bible to the cross from the cross. Every Bible story has three components. First, God's law. Second, God's compassion. Third, God's miracle. Opening your Bible opens miracles. The Bible as one story is holy enough in our lives. Day 121, Proverbs 21 to 24. Do not envy a foolish person's wealth. A truly wise man is one who does not envy the prosperity of the evil, but overcomes greed for wealth and fills his heart with the fear of God. What's the point? By keeping to God's ways, we can avoid increasing people in distress, people in debt, and people with resentment. If people try to become rich by taking other people's belongings or by cheating, then it will increase the people who are in distress, in debt, and full of resentment. In order to prevent this, God taught Abraham and his descendants about showing God's grace. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. A kingdom of priests does not just stop with a few rules. It has actions that follow. In regards to this, Solomon wrote, A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Solomon dreamed to be like his father in dancing and praising God, and to make a country that was just and righteous in the eyes of God. As Solomon knew this, he was able to understand the heart of the real mother, who was in distress due to another lying mother who wanted to take her child. Second point, winning and losing is always in the hands of the Lord. The Bible teaches that battles belong to God. Winning and losing do not depend on numbers or tactics, but on God. Moses, Joshua, Gideon, and David knew and experienced this. The Exodus generation saw how God fought for them in the battle against the Amalekites. God's method was for Moses to keep his hands up. As long as Moses' arm was up, the Israelites would win. And if it went down, the Amalekites would win. The battle during the days of Samuel against the Philistines was also governed and won through God. David knew this and so was able to fight against Goliath. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For battles is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. Third point. Good habits should be made during youth. God told the Israelites to teach the laws to their children. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn. To revere the Lord his God and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the Lord, when you lie down and when you get up. Solomon also emphasized that the laws should be taught during youth. Then one would be able to study what they have learned during their youth when they grew old. Timothy is a very good example of this, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. 
All scriptures is God's breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Fourth point, making a false accusation about someone is only your loss. It is hard to find someone who is more famous for their trial than Solomon during the ancient days. Regarding trials, Solomon said, do not exploit the poor and do not crush the needy in court. For the Lord will take up their case and will exalt life for life. In Deuteronomy, it is written that trials belong to God. God spoke a lot about the sin of making a false accusation about someone. Hence, God listened to the words of Abel. The Lord said, What have you done? Listen. Your brother's blood cried out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. David told God of his state of mind because of Saul and said that God was his judge. David knew that God would help his situation because he had been falsely accused. David's son Absalom misused the trials in order to carry out his coup d'etat. God through the prophet Amos emphasized how it was wrong to make false accusations. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. God furthermore said that he would punish those who were not just through the prophet Jeremiah. Thus, making false accusations will lead that person to no good. Fifth point, there is no point in envying the wicked. Just because the wicked look like they have succeeded does not mean that we should envy them. The more we experience suffering, the more we can understand God's compassion. And therefore, we should not envy the wicked. Do not envy the wicked. Do not desire their company. For their hearts plot violence and their lips talk about making trouble. David sang that the wicked will fly by like the wind. It may seem that the wicked prosper in the short term, but like the words of Prophet Habakkuk, the one with the face will live and prosper. Day 122, Proverbs 25-29, Solomon's Metaphors. Proverbs explained the characteristics and end of the foolish and stressed that we should turn away from such behavior and be on our guard against them. First point. Solomon and Jesus both used metaphors to make their messages easy and relatable. Jesus used the countless metaphors to teach the people about the kingdom of God. Metaphors are an easy way to help people relate to the message or understand better. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it walked all through the door. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then, in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. Solomon also used a lot of metaphors in his proverbs to unravel his wisdom. An example of his metaphor can be found in Proverbs 25 to 29. Second point, a wicked servant is lazy and a good servant is loyal. Solomon said that a royal servant is like a snow-cooled drink to his master at harvest time. Like a snow-cooled drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. An example of a royal servant was Abram's servant Eliezer. Then he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. Joseph was also a loyal servant to Potiphar after he was sold as a slave in Egypt. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Bezalel and Oholiab were also royal servants in the making of the tabernacle ordered by God. So Bezalel, Oholiab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Someone who cannot be left out is Moses, whom God called my servant. Third point, the foolish are stupid because they think they are wise. This is what Solomon said in regards to a foolish person. Like snow in summer or rain in harvest, honor is not fitting for a fool. Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse does not come to rest. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a load for the backs of fools. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. The most foolish person is one who does not believe in God and one who does not realize their own mistakes. Fourth point, one who helps the poor will not perish. Those who walk their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have their fear of poverty. Those who give to the poor will lack nothing. But those who close their eyes to them receive many causes. Even the wise who worship God cannot live without material goods. However, this does not justify acting according to one's greed. A wise person is someone who is able to keep God's words. That person also does not accept bribery. That person does all they can to help someone with their strengths. Someone who God looks upon with a favorable eye is one who can use their skills to help others. Fifth point, a country succeeds with righteousness and perishes with the acceptance of bribery. Solomon thought that if a judge starts to accept bribes, then the country will fall down in ruins. That is why it is so important for the country to be built upon righteousness. If a king works hard for righteousness, then that country is bound to succeed. Oppositely, if a king works hard only for his own profit, then that country is bound to perish. A king should not ask for too much tax or tributes. Examples of kings who did this are numerous in the Bible. 
including the time of the prophet Micah. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. This can also be seen during the time of Paul when Roman governor Felix asked for bribes. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send it for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Day 123, Proverbs 32-31 A woman more precious than pearls. Eager talked about God's existence through deep insight into nature, and Lemuel's mother taught the way kings were to go. First point, Eager prayed for two things. Eager was someone who considered God's reputation. God therefore valued and blessed Eager. Eager prayed that unnecessary and false sources would leave his mind. Eager also prayed to God to not make him either too rich or too poor. The most important part of his prayer was his longing to praise God and to make sure God's name does not become belittled. Eager was someone who knew his own limitations, but this is where his wisdom started. He was able to trust and seek in God because he knew his limitations and weaknesses. Second point, Eager introduced the four things which seem small but are wise. Eager spoke of four things on earth that are small but wise. Antis, Hyraxes, Locustus, and Lizards. These things appear extremely small, but they are indeed wise. Eager therefore prayed that his limitations could be filled with wisdom and that he too could become wise like these four things that seem small. Four things on us are small, yet they are extremely wise. Antis are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Hyraxes are creatures of little power yet they make their home in the cracks. Locustus have no king, yet they advance together in ranks. A wizard can be caught with a hand, yet it is found in king's palaces. Third point, Lemuel's mother advised two things to her son. Lemuel's mother asked where her son was going to spend his strength. The position of a king came with great power, and it also came with great wealth. Thus, it was important in deciding how the king was going to use his wealth and power. His mother emphasized the important role of women and how influential they can be. Solomon's later years were shaken by women, so this was indeed important advice. Lemuel's mother bore him by offering him to God, and she hoped that he would become a king pleading to God. Thus, she gave him these two advices. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer to my prayers. Do not spend your strength on woman. You are bigger on those who ruin kings. Fourth point, it is the king's duties to judge correctly. The Bible teaches that battles and trials belong to God. To look at a few cases in the Bible, the first would be David. David reigned over all Israel, doing what was just and right for all his people. Solomon was able to follow in his father's footsteps. 
Keho Shabbat also focused on trials and made sure they were just and righteous. Another example is the trial of Ezra, who even impressed the king of Persia. He was given control over the whole Levant region. Fifth point, a woman who is more valuable than pearls saves her family and even the world. The kings of Israel were expected to focus on a kingdom of priests and make sure that they were leading the people according to the laws. But this meant that other areas could lack. This is where the law of woman came in. A wise woman who can help her husband to do the best he can. A few wise women are recorded in the Bible. One is Moses' sister Miriam. There is also Rahab, Deborah, Abigail, and Esther. All these women played excellent roles in helping their community with their wisdom. Day 124, Song of Songs 1-4 to The Love Story in Song of Songs Solomon sang God's love for humans through the pure and intense love between himself and the Shulamite woman. First point, through Song of Songs, we can read about God's unfailing love for us. Solomon, who was recorded as one of the greatest kings of Israel, fell deeply in love with a Shulamite woman. Their love for one another exceeded everything. True love is about considering one another and focusing on one another. When one is next to the other, the last of the scenery goes bloody. True love means that one makes the other person feel extraordinary and respected. Through Solomon's Song of Songs, we can learn about God's unfailing love for us. Second point, love starts with looking at each other. Solomon was the wisest king to be recorded in the history of Israel. Solomon was also the representative king when it came to luxuries. But when Solomon fell in love, all those things faded out and he became just a man in love. Through this love that Solomon experienced, we can see how God loves us so perfectly and affectionately. Solomon expressed his love as such. I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Peru's chariot horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with the earrings, your neck with the strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. A person who is in love has an ever-expanding heart. Solomon fell in love with a woman who was much lower in status than him, but that was irrelevant to him. They became each other's greatest joy. Here we can really learn about God's profound love for us. Third point, true love lies within each other. If one is in love, everything looks and appears beautiful. This is like how God forgives us and love us despite our flaws and faults. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. Solomon's prosperity of the fig tree and vines also represents the love he feels for the Shulamite woman. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. When two people are in love, they are not two but one. That is why they share in their joy and in their pain. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit or fruit from me, you can do nothing. First point, love overcomes social status. 
Song of Songs 3, verses 1 to 5, recites the song of the bride who misses her husband, and verses 6 to 11 follows on to the song of the Jerusalem woman who also waits for marriage. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Without effort or waiting, love cannot last. In order to find true love, one must do anything they can in order to meet them. We must also have the same attitude towards God. The king of Israel, Solomon, comes to meet his wife, the Shulamite woman. True love overcomes status. Likewise, despite our faults and flaws, God still loves us and pours his efforts on us. Fifth point, our focus should always be towards God. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep. Just the shone coming up from the washing. Each has its twin, not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the harvest of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with the courses of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Solomon was someone who had in his hands the greatest power and the greatest wealth. But the greatest thing to him was the Shulamite woman. This was true love. We cannot understand this in theory. God loved us so much that he sent his one and only son. That is ultimate love. Day 125 Song of Songs, 5 to 8. The Shulamite Woman. The true love that is sincere and unites to people cannot be replaced by anything and has power stronger than death. First point God is Emmanuel, who is always with us. I slept, but my heart was awake. Listen, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my dove, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. Someone who is in love is sensitive to what the other person says and does. This also applies to our relationship with God. Someone who loves God should always focus on his heart and his plans. Second point. The love between Solomon and the Shulamite woman was expressed through my beloved, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. Song of Songs chapter 6 continues the love song between Solomon and the Shulamite woman. My beloved has gone down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to browse in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He browses among the lilies. They end up becoming one. The Shulamite woman sang, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. This is possibly the greatest expression of love throughout the whole song. This was the relationship between Solomon and the Shulamite woman and moreover the relationship between God and us. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Solomon had 60 queens and 80 concubines during his early rule. 
However, his heart was focused entirely on the Shulamite woman. Third point, we are God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and we are God's special possession. Chapter 7 continues the love song. Solomon says that beauty lies in love. How beautiful you are and how pleasing my love with your delights. A person is most beautiful when they are in love. Also, when a person receives love, they are as beautiful as a flower. Solomon's love reminds us of Jesus' love as well as Paul's love that knew no end. We also can learn about God's love for humans and how He waits for us despite our sins and faults. When you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, then you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Fourth point, God has everlasting love for us. Song of Songs, chapter 8, is a continuation of the love song. Love overcomes even death. This is the power of love. Love can conquer anything. Place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. Is jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all the wealth of one's house for love, it would be utterly scorched. Some of songs reaches its peak towards the end. The conversation between Solomon and the Shulamite woman reveals their deep and profound love and respect for each other. In their love was longing, fear, and the long light of doubt. However, they managed to overcome all these obstacles. Now their love was unbreakable. God's love for us is also unbreakable. Paul sang of God's unbreakable love for us. Neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Fifth point, true love even overcomes death. True love can even overcome death, and nothing can compare to that strength. Love is as strong as death. The love that flows in Song of Songs is the love that flows in the entire Bible of God for us. God loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son who waits to greet us once again. Day 126, 1 Kings 11, the second half of Solomon's rule. Solomon's heart turned away from God, which meant that the shrines of idols were built in Jerusalem and the country was threatened of division. First point, towards the end of Solomon's monarchy, his heart shifted away from a kingdom of priests and towards the format of an empire. Solomon could have used his late years of rule to implement the expansion of the Jerusalem temple through the court of Gentiles as he prayed during the prayer of dedication during his early rule. However, his later rule shifted from a kingdom of priests to the format of an empire. Solomon started to accept foreign princesses as his wives, and one thing led to another, and he ended up having a thousand wives and concubines. These international marriage deals made Solomon a very busy and tired man. Second point. Different from David, who maintained his heart towards God, Solomon had a change of heart three times. David was always focused on God, whether he was full of joy, distressed, or in despair. 
و سالومون had a change in heart three times. We can see that during his early rule, Solomon prayed for wisdom in order to rule over God's people wisely. God blessed Solomon's heart. The second is towards the later years of his rule, when his heart started to shift away from God. Because of this, God came to Solomon twice. However, Solomon did not turn his heart back to God which tore the country into two. The third is right towards the end of his life, when he wrote Ecclesiastes. He wrote this book full of regret. At least, he changed his heart before he died, and he came back to God full of repentance. Third point, the characteristics of Solomon's later rule or extravagant luxury, excess tax, and religious decomposition. The early years of Solomon's rule were not lavish or extravagant. He managed to set up a feasible system to distribute something to all the 12 tribes. But towards the later years of his rule, international marriages changed Solomon to become lavish and extravagant. Solomon started to impose a great deal of tax on people, and the later years were also full of religious decomposition. With Solomon's heart shifting away from a kingdom of priests, he started to abuse his political power, centering on the tribe of Judah. This resembled Saul's rule. Fourth point. Jeroboam, the hard worker, became Solomon's liver. God warned Solomon twice to return to him, but when Solomon refused to listen, God became angry and proclaimed that he would take away the country from Solomon and give it to one of his servants. As David appeared in front of Saul, Jeroboam appeared in front of Solomon. Jeroboam was an able architect whom Solomon had acknowledged during the rule of David. God proclaimed that he would anoint Jeroboam as a king. After Solomon died, God revealed the reason for taking ten tribes from him. God also revealed what was to happen for Solomon's son after Solomon's death. God moreover revealed his covenant made with Jeroboam. Jeroboam had to flee to Egypt for a while from Solomon. Fifth point, the reason God did not take away all of Solomon's ruling power was because of the covenant he made with Judah and David. Through Jacob's blessing, God had given a promise to Jacob's fourth son, Judah. Later on, God made a covenant with David during the planning of the Jerusalem temple through the prophet Nathan. But my love will never be taken away from me, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. The reason God did not take away Solomon's power entirely was because of his promise with Judah and David. Because of the covenant God made and because of the fact that David was God's servant, Solomon and his sons stayed as a king until the last king, Zedekiah. Day 127 Ecclesiastes 1-3 Effort and useless effort In the last days of Solomon, who had enjoyed great wisdom, wealth, and prosperity, than anyone else, the confession that everything was meaningless was lifted. First point, for the first half of his rule, Solomon's achievements were fruitful, and for the second half, his achievements were futile. During his early rule, Solomon prayed for wisdom to God, and with the wisdom given from God, Solomon was able to understand the heart of the mother who was fighting for her son and also constructed the Jerusalem temple prepared by his father David. 
but towards the latter part of his rule, Solomon shifted away from a kingdom of priests and started to concentrate on his own business. But in the end, Solomon realized that this was all meaningless. Second point, Solomon said all was meaningless based on four broad points. Solomon, who was ever so wise, wrote in his later years that all things are meaningless countless times. This was based on four points. The first was that all human efforts away from God were meaningless. The second was that although nature is lasting, human life is short. The third was that human desires are endless. The fourth was that nothing is new under the sun and everything is simply repeated. Although Solomon was full of regret, he still managed to gather his wisdom before he died and recorded Ecclesiastes after Proverbs. Third point, Solomon claimed that wisdom without God is worthless wisdom. Human wisdom is eventually meaningless. This is because human wisdom is incredibly limited. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this, too, is a chasing after the wind. Solomon, who had more wisdom than anyone else, confessed this. He confessed that all human efforts away from God are completely meaningless. Solomon realized that his life away from God was totally empty and meaningless. Fourth point, Solomon claimed that human glory without God is just empty joy. Human joy is only short pleasure. Solomon was someone who did not seek short-term pleasure. He tried hard to experience happiness, but in the end, he confessed that this was all meaningless. Solomon had countless servants and wealth. In other words, not a single human being on this earth has experienced more wealth or pleasure than Solomon. But Solomon, who experienced wealth and pleasure to this extent, confessed that all was totally meaningless. Solomon also confessed that through death, he realized all the more that all human pleasures are meaningless. Fifth point, humans can overcome meaninglessness if they believe in God. Solomon, who had the greatest wisdom, said that all things have a time and place. Humans have limited days on this earth. Humans are finite, whereas God is infinite. That is why God wants us to know that in our finite lives, we must know that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. God has decided a time for us also. We must live according to God's decided time. That is why a wise person uses their time effectively. Day 128, Ecclesiastes 4-7 to A life without God? Wisdom is to admit that the life of humans is finite, and to obey and follow the wisdom and absolute sovereignty 
of infinity God. First point, a way to overcome meaninglessness is to live alongside others. Solomon wrote that a way for humans to overcome meaninglessness even slightly is by living alongside others. Although Solomon wrote that all is meaningless, a way to decrease this meaninglessness is to live together. In order to do this, it is important to meet someone who can walk the same path as us. Solomon provided four reasons as to why two is better than one. The first is because two can work hard together to produce a more effective outcome. The second is because the two can rely on one another and help the other when they fall. The third is because two can recover from grief together and experience happiness together. The fourth is because two can create a stronger impact. Second point, God's people should have three attitudes. Solomon, who dedicated a great deal of wealth to his teachings, left us a strong message. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore, fear God. Solomon said that we should have three attitudes. The first was to listen to God. Before Solomon's words, Samuel had said the following to Saul. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of lambs. The second was to be humble when requesting to God. The third was to be sincere in making an oath and keeping by it. Third point, living without God is meaningless even if you live for a thousand years. No material object can feel the meaninglessness of life. Seeing something with the eye is meaningless. Someone with lots of wealth or honor cannot gain happiness. Someone with lots of children cannot gain happiness or a long life. Someone who is wise cannot gain happiness. Solomon claimed that even if a person was to live for a thousand years, they would not live forever in happiness or get what they desire. Only by believing and obeying in God, one can gain true happiness. First point, an enduring heart is better than an arrogant heart. Solomon made a few comparisons to deliver his teachings. Solomon said that a good name is better than fine perfume. He then said that the day of death is better than the day of birth. Next was that it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Solomon claimed that a wise person realized that it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. Solomon furthermore taught that sadness is better than laughter and that it is better to listen to a wise person's rebuke, more so than listening to a song of a foolish person. Solomon continued that the end of something is better than the beginning. It is also better to endure than to have an arrogant heart. Solomon further said that the past is better than the present. Fifth point, God gave humans both ups and downs. Solomon said that one should always consider their end whilst living. A wise person admits that human life is finite and that we are God's creation. Wisdom is being humble in front of God, our Creator, and accepting that God governs our life. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what He has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. 
Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. A person should always consider their downs when they are up and vice versa. God gives us ups and downs so that we can stay humble and content. Upon realizing this, Solomon advised to trust God and to be content. Day 129 Ecclesiastes 8-12 Learning about meaningless Wise preacher Solomon stressed that remembering that everything in this world is worthless and fearing God our Creator is our duty. First point, humans cannot escape their death or prolong their life no matter how hard they try. Solomon, who experienced more wealth or glory than any other human thought, that no human has the ability to prolong their life or to change the day they die. That is why humans should also accept that we are creations of God and that we are limited in what we can do. We should always be humble. The way we can live wisely in this earth is to be humble in front of God and to always try our best to obey Him. Solomon claimed that humans have three vital limitations. The first is that humans do not know the day of their death. The second is that humans do not know whether they can survive war. The third is that no human can escape God's judgment. The second point, a wicked person will eventually perish and they will become like a shadow. Regarding the wicked, David said that their days will become like shadows. Adding to this, Solomon said, Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. It may seem that the world is full of people who are anything but righteous. It sometimes seems that the wicked prosper more than the kind people. This sometimes raises the question of whether God truly exists. However, just because the wicked are not punished immediately does not mean that their sins go unpunished. The wicked will most certainly receive their punishment, and knowing this is wisdom. All the wicked of the earth you discard like draws, therefore I love your statute. Third point. The wine bearer was able to remember Joseph because God helped him remember. The wise Solomon claimed that human accomplishment was not entirely down to their efforts. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does the food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or a favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. If humans succeed just based on their efforts, then humans would not need God. The people of God in the Bible all tried extremely hard and also asked for God's help. For example, it was God who helped the wine bearer remember Joseph after two years in prison. This was not due to Joseph's efforts, but because God blessed him. Oppositely, David tried his best to defeat the Philistines and to help the Keilah. But the people of Keilah reported David to Saul rather than thanking him. Seen from the perspective of effort, then this was a huge blow for David. But due to this instant, David was able to strengthen his faith in God. Solomon said that instead of relying on human effort, we should believe and obey God. Fourth point, one should dream in their teens 
and learn that everything is meaningless in their twenties. Solomon revealed the reason as to why he wrote Ecclesiastes at an old age. This was because he wanted to emphasize the days of youth and how it was important to know that all is meaningless from the days of youth. The days of youth and the days after youth are meaningless unless you remember God the Creator. As a farmer, cannot plan wind or rain or the time to cultivate. Humans cannot plan life without God. Solomon wrote that in the days of youth, humans should learn to be kind and generous to their neighbors. Solomon also emphasized the importance of relying on God. He further wrote about the importance of being hardworking and sincere in the days of youth, and also to live a joyful life during youth. As such, we should learn to dream during teens, and learn that everything is meaningless during our twenties. This can help people to not live a meaningless life. Fifth point, God judges all behaviors of humans. Solomon, who started his book by saying that all things are meaningless, now comes to his conclusion. His conclusion is that all things are meaningless if one does not believe in and obey God. This is because God judges all right and evil. Solomon stressed the importance of remembering God. We have finite days on this earth, and so we should try our best to live wisely. Solomon wrote that the true wisdom was to figure this out from youth. Day 130 Job 1-3 A righteous man's suffering Even when Job had lost everything due to Satan's test, Job trusted God who permitted his suffering. First point, the book of Job is regarded as a scholarly masterpiece. The book of Job records the conversations and arguments that Job had with his three friends. The book can be categorized into three parts. The first is that the scene encompasses the heavens and the earth. The second is that it deals with the topic of human suffering. The third is that it is unraveled through a dialogue in the form of conversations and arguments. The book of Job contains Job's questions and God's questions. In between these questions are some of the best conversations and arguments. Second point, God values not silver or gold, but his servants. God boasted of Job to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God only referred to a small number of people when calling them his servant. To list them, there was Moses, Caleb, David, Jesus, and also Paul. And there was also Job, whom God referred to as his servant. The story starts with Satan testing Job. The reason Satan tested Job was because God boasted of him. Satan therefore wanted to ruin him. Satan claimed that Job was only righteous because God had blessed him. So God permitted Satan to test Job. Third point, after Job's first test, God was able to boast about Job all the more. Through Satan's first test and Job's confession, we can see how God boasted of him. Satan's test began and Job suddenly heard that the Sabians attacked, and that they killed Job's servants and took his auction and donkeys. Next, God's fire killed the sheep 
and the remaining servants. Third, the Chaldeans came and attacked the camels and the servants. Fourth, a wind came and killed all of Job's children and knocked down Job's entire house. All this was reported in one go. Despite the horror of the situation, Job surprisingly did not curse God, but rather made his confession that all belonged to God, and it was in his power if he wanted to take them away. Regarding his situation, Job firstly tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said that the Lord gave him everything and so the Lord had the right to take it away from him. Job did not resent or curse God in all of this. Fourth point, after Job's second test, his wife leaves him and his three friends come to him. The first test for Job was excruciatingly painful and difficult, but God gave him another test. The second test began with God prizing Job in front of Satan for passing the first test. At this, Satan said that Job was yet to fail as his healthy was still with him. God permitted Satan to go ahead and strike the second exam. And so began the second test. Satan hit Job's body with painful sores so hard that he took a piece of broken pottery to scratch his skin. It was so bad that it made Job an identifiable. However, Job still did not curse or resent God. Things became so bad that Job's wife left him. It was then that his three friends appeared. Fifth point. The debate between Job and his friends began. Job's friends came, but they were unable to speak for seven days because of the shock. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. But they began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Job's three friends were Eliphaz, Bildad, and Jopha. After seven days passed, Job said three things. First, he cursed the day that he was born. Second, he said he desired death. Third, he wanted to know why God had brought about such distress on him. Job asks God to end his life and thus end his suffering. Day 131, Job 4-7, Eliphaz's Rebuke Job's friends came to Job, who went through hard times because of great affliction. However, Eliphaz began to condemn Job rather than to comfort him. First point, Job argued with his friends regarding his suffering. The first argument between Job and his friends is recorded in chapters 4 to 14. The first dialogue is the attempt of the friends to console Job by advising him to repent. But this only increases Job's misery. The second argument is recorded between chapters 15 and 21. The theme of this second argument was sinner, and this made Job cry out to God all the more. The third argument is recorded in chapters 22 to 26, and Job's friend accused Job for sinning even further. All throughout their conversation, Job's friends tried to solve this through the theory of causality. This was where Job disagreed. Instead of causality, Job kept asking why God would do this to him. When Job questioned God, 
God eventually provided him with answers in chapters 38 to 41. Second point, Eliphaz began the argument by rebuking Job. Among the friends, Eliphaz was the first to speak. But now trouble comes to you and you are discouraged. It strikes you and you are dismayed. Should not your pity be your confidence and your blameless ways your hope? Eliphaz said that Job used to be the one who advised and disciplined others and how now he had lost hope in God. He failed to see that Job looked after others and tried to protect the weak. But Eliphaz rebuked Job and told him to look back on his mistakes. Third point, Eliphaz tried to explain Job's suffering using causality and told him to repent. Eliphaz claimed that Job's suffering was due to his sin. He interpreted the situation using the theory of causality and did not go on to consider God's mercy. What he did not see was that God does not govern the world based on causality but through his will and his vision. Thus, the Bible is full of God's promises, blessings, and mercy. Eliphaz claimed that humans are not righteous and that instead they are weak with limitations. Eliphaz used his own theories and interpretations, which were totally subjective. Eliphaz thought he was helping and said all that he wanted to say, but he failed to persuade Job until the end. Fourth point, Job claimed that he was innocent and told Eliphaz that his words did not console him at all. To Eliphaz, Job replied and said that he was innocent. Job stated that his suffering was given by God. He furthermore told Eliphaz that his words were not consoling in the slightest. Job said to his friends, Deliver me from the hand of the enemy. Rescue me from the clutches of the Lutherans. What Job was asking for was not actual help. What he wanted was for them to be with him without criticizing him. But Job's friends did not have such a heart. Job moreover stated that he was indeed righteous, but God later rebuked him for this. Relent, do not be unjust. Reconsider, for my integrity is at stake. Fifth point, Job started to call out for God who was silent. Job started to speak of his suffering. When I lie down, I think how long before I get up. The night drags on, and I toss and turn until dawn. My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. Job spoke out to God. He asked God to end his life. Job furthermore asked God why he was given such suffering. What is mankind that you make so much of them, that you give them so much attention, that you examine them every morning and test them every moment? Will you never look away from me or let me alone even for an instant? Job asked the gods whether he had actually sinned, and if so, then he asked for God's forgiveness. Why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust. You will search for me, but I will be no more. Day 132, Job 8 to 10. Although your beginnings seem humble, Bildad, another friend of Job's, also began to judge and condemn Job with black and white logic. Job expressed his innocence to God. First point, Bildad said that Job's children died because God is a righteous judge, but this was Bildad's folly. Next to speak after Eliphaz was Bildad. 
Bildad started to speak about God's righteousness and furthermore advised Job to repent. Bildad's advice and interpretations were similar to Eliphaz. Bildad claimed from the beginning that Job's thoughts were wrong. Bildad claimed that Job was going through suffering because he had sinned. Bildad furthermore stated that Job's children must have also sinned and were killed as a punishment. When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Even if this had been true, it was not Bildad's place to claim this. This was also the same in the case of Jacob. When he heard from his sons that Joseph had died, he tore his robe and cried out loud. Judah was also the same when his two sons died after God had killed them for their evil. Even when Judah knew that his sons were evil, he still could not stop feeling grief. Job had lost his children and had lamented. It was really long of Bildad to say this to Job. Second point, God does not accept Bildad's interpretation that Job's beginnings seemed humble, but his future will be prosperous. Bildad told Job that although God had killed his children, if Job repented, then God would make his future prosperous. Later on, God rebuked Bildad for all these words. Bildad himself should have repented for saying this, rather than advising Job to repent. Bildad tried to console Job with such unsuitable words. Although he had been a friend of Job's for a long time, his words at this point only caused more pain to Job. The picture of God that Bildad painted was one who had a very low level of righteousness. Third point, to Bildad, who spoke of God's righteousness, Job replied with God's wisdom, power, and forgiveness. Job spoke out to Bildad. Job compared God's grace to human injustice. Job moreover praised God, who created the universe and showed human's grace. Job also accepted God's sovereign power. Job's fundamental thought was that it was God who gave and God who took away. Job claimed that he asked God for mercy in such a situation which he could not explain or fathom. Job expressed that he could not understand why the God of mercy and righteousness was causing him such pain. Job stated that he wanted the righteous God to carry out his trial. Fourth point, Job, who spoke to Bildad, now turned and spoke up to God. Job asked God, the Creator, why he was given such trouble. He added that if God was going to give him so much pain, he should not have put him on earth in the first place. I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaint and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. I say to God, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. The more his pain deepened, the more he started to speak out to God. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands, while you smile on the plans of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see as a mortal sees? Though you know that I am not guilty and that no one can rescue me from your hand, to express his anguish and started to curse his life and the day he was born. Despite this, Job believed that he lived under the sovereign rod. Fifth point, Job pleaded to God to end his suffering. Job said that he believed that God created him, but something he could not get his head around was why the sovereign rod was giving him such awful pain.
Despite his pain, Job regarded God as his creator, the workers of your hands. You molded me like a clay. You clothed me with skin and flesh, and knit me together with bones and sinews. You gave me life, and you bring me out of the womb. Job was confused as to why he was suffering so much. Whereas God was testing to see how he endured his test. The reason why God tests people is to ultimately bless them. Day 133, Job 11 to 14, Pleading to God. Hearing the word of Jopha, who condemned Job, saying that even his sign was unrighteous, Job criticized his friend's arrogance and asked for God's wisdom. First point, Job rebuked Job for complaining. Regarding Job's suffering, Job criticized that Job had too much to say. Job for the Boa claimed that Job was an arrogant person who enjoyed boasting and someone who liked to look down on others. He stated that Job was a self-righteous man. We can see that Job and his friends were having the worst conversation. What Job wanted from his friends was comfort and their company. But his friends rather criticized and rebuked him. Second point, Job has said that Job's complaining came from a place of arrogance and that God would soon show his will. Jopha went on to say that Job's suffering was less compared to the sin he had committed and advised him to repent to God. He stressed that Job was going through such suffering because of his sin against God. In Jopha's eyes, Job was a sinner. He had no evidence for his words, but he carried on with his theory nonetheless. He twisted Job's words that he had spoken in pain and turned them into complaints against God. Job added that Job should repent and that only then he would be blessed. Job was indeed an early Sadducee, yet if you devote your heart to him, and stretch out your hands to him. If you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent. He was convinced that he had told Job the correct answer. However, Job's interpretation could not be further away from the truth. Third point, Job started to argue about the limitations of his friend's wisdom. Job's friends said countless words, which they thought were wise and correct. But Job criticized their words. He claimed that their words were built on causality, and that they had no evidence or depths in their advice. Job moreover claimed that God's work cannot be explained through causality or human interpretations. Job knew that God punished the wicked and blessed the meek. But when he faced his situation, his thoughts became blood. Job came to accept that God was the only one who gives blessings and misfortunes. Job moreover came to terms that humans cannot decide or govern who God blesses or gives misfortunes to. He argues against the black and white theories of his friends. You, however, smear me with lies. You are worthless physicians, all of you. If only you would be altogether silent. For you, that would be wisdom. And instead, he begs his friends to be sympathetic. Hear now my argument. Listen to the pleas of my lips. Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf? Will you speak deceitfully for him? Will you show him partiality? Will you argue the case for God? Both point, Job no longer confronted or argued with his friends. Now Job stood before God and started to speak out. 
Job wanted to stand in front of the righteous God. Job started to plead to God, only grant me these two things, God, and then I will not hide from you. Withdraw your hand far from me and stop frightening me with your terrors. Job also prayed to God to ask him why he was suffering. Then summon me, and I will answer, or let me speak, and you reply to me. How many wrongs and sins have I committed? Fifth point. Instead of learning away, Job stood before God. Job said to God that he had not sinned but was being punished. But rather than learning away, he wanted God to unravel the answers for him. Job also sincerely asked God to end his suffering. We can see just how bad his suffering was, and we can also see how despite his pain, he still had hope in God. Day 134, or Job 15-17 The Lamenting Heart the argument between Job's friends and Job could not come to an agreement. Job again pleaded with God about his suffering. First point, Eliphaz heard Job's deep distress through his ears rather than in his heart. Job now started the second round of arguments with his friends. When the friends had arrived, they came to console Job. But as the time progressed, instead of consoling, they rather criticized and rebuked him. Eliphaz dissected Job's words and tried to give him answers with his own interpretations. He had no warmth or heart to console Job, but rather focused on calling Job an arrogant man. Do you listen in on God's counsel? Do you have a monopoly on wisdom? What do you know that we do not know? What insights do you have that we do not have? Elipad now openly rebuked Job. He believed that he had enough wisdom and righteousness to say such things. Second point. Eliphaz started to interpret Job's situation through the theory of causality. Eliphaz started to talk about causality again and how it was logic that the wicked were punished according to their sin. His theory regarding the wicked was that they would live in pain and that they would eventually perish and moreover, that they would live in darkness. They would live in pain and then eventually die. Regarding the punishment of the wicked, Eliphaz theorized that it was because they were arrogant against God, only liked materialistic things and lived according to their own will rather than God's will. He claimed that the wicked could not preserve themselves and that their only path was destruction. Third point, Job called his friends consolers who brought disaster. After hearing the words of Eliphaz, Job called them consolers who actually brought disasters. Although they wanted to discuss Job's suffering, they had no heart to actually console him or share in his pain. I have heard many things like this. You are miserable comforters, all of you. Will your long winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? Job told them that they only added to his grief and pain. First point Job once again confirmed his distressful situation. Now, Job's friends and surrounding people could no longer recognize him. A man once respected among the people became ruined overnight. No one had any expectations left for Job. The only thing they gave him 
was pitiful and despising looks. All Job could do now was to ask for God's help. Give me, O oh God, the pledge you demand. Who else will put up security for me? You have crossed their minds to understanding, therefore you will not let them triumph. Job claimed that his only hope was death. He had no strength or will left to argue with his friends. Now he only looked to God and found hope in him. This is what made him a wise man. Pip's point, Job wanted to free himself from the useless argument with his friends. Job said, nevertheless, the righteous will hold to their ways, and those with clean hands will grow stronger. But come on, all of you try again. I will not find a wise man among you. Job wanted to free himself from his friend's stupid words. They only added to his grief and pain. So, he said that all those who consider themselves wise or righteous would not be able to find true wisdom. Day 135, Job 18 to 19. Having sincere hope, hearing the evil words of his friends who would not admit that his suffering was the suffering of a righteous person, he pleaded for them to take pity on him. First point, Bildad rebuked Job with his ever-consistent words. Bildad replied and said to Job, When will you end these speeches? Be sensible, and then we can talk. We ask at this point who between Job and his friends understood this situation. Job did not understand his situation. Thus, he was asking God why this had happened to him and was trying to make his friends understand that he did not need their rebuking. Neither Bildad nor the other friends understood the situation. Bildad made Job's suffering even worse by rebuking him. Second point, the wicked person whom Bildad referred to was based on his thoughts on Job. Bildad explained that the wicked was bound to perish. Bildad's reference to the wicked was Job. He said that light will disappear for the wicked. He then said that the wicked will grow tired whilst working. Third, he said that the wicked will get tangled in the rope so that he cannot walk back up. Fourth, he said that the wicked will be chased by fear. Fifth, he said that the wicked will face illness and eventually perish. Sixth, the wicked will be left with no place to stay. Seventh, the wicked will have no descendants. All these points Bildad was referring to was based on Job's situation. Third point, Job claimed that the one to give him suffering was God. Amidst his suffering, Job said a few things to his friends. The first was that God gave him suffering he could not escape. The second was that God had taken away his glory. The third was that God had taken away all his hope. The fourth was that God had attacked him as if he was an enemy. The fifth was that God had made all his family and friends drift away from him. Fourth point. Job asked his friends to have a compassion for him. The rebuking of his friends was even more painful for Job than his physical aching. Job no longer had the energy to argue with them. Job asked his friends who were treating him like a sinner for their confession. Fifth point, now Job's only hope was God. Job's friends did not listen to Job's request for confession, but later started another argument about God's righteous trial. Hearing this, 
Job confessed that the only one who could help him regain his honor was God. The only one that Job could turn to at this point was God. Job confessed that God was his salvation and that God was the one who looked after him. Job had everlasting faith in God even midst his deathly suffering. Day 136, Job 20-21 The reason Job's wealth disappeared The mind of the friends who did not understand Job's condition did not have love and care for Job, which was what Job needed desperately. First point, when Job had no energy to listen to his friends any longer, Job started to spur up his argument. The suffering that Job was enduring was one that no one could relate to. All the things that had happened to him were beyond one's imagination. But Job's friends, who had never experienced anything similar, were eager to discuss and interpret the reasons behind his suffering. Job claimed that Job was a sinner and started to talk about God's righteous trials. When Job disagreed with him, Job became angry again and started to say, My troubled thoughts prompt me to answer because I am greatly disturbed. I hear a rebuke that dishonors me, and my understanding inspires me to reply. No matter what Job said to Jopha, Job was a sinner. Second point, Jopha made the statement that a son must repay for his father's sins. His children must make amends to the poor. His own hands must give back his wealth. It is said God stores up the punishment of the wicked for their children. Let him repay the wicked so that they themselves will experience it. Let their own eyes see their destruction. Let them drink the cup of the wrath of the Almighty. This statement was made till the days of Jesus, but Jesus claimed that no child was punished because of their parents. Jophar's criticism was based on his jealousy towards Job. Jophar used God's name and God's righteousness to back up his arguments. Third point. Jopha claimed that the reason why Job lost his possessions was because God had punished him for his wicked deeds. Job was someone who continually made offerings to God in the thought that his children may unknowingly commit sin in front of God because of his wealth. In fact, Job's wealth had nothing to do with his situation. But Jopa made a connection and moreover related this to God's trial. Jopa lectured that a wicked could prosper for a while, but that they were bound to perish. What he was saying was that Job was headed in the way of the wicked. First point, regarding the righteous being blessed and the wicked being punished, Job had different thoughts to his friends. To Jopha's theory, Job disagreed. Job furthermore told his friends that their arguments were wrong. Job told them that Jopha's statement that the righteous will prosper and the wicked must perish was a one-dimensional interpretation. Job told them that causality was a limited theory and that there were real cases of the wicked prospering. Job's friends condemned Job, but they spoke like they had no sins themselves. They did not look back on their sins. They were extremely critical of Job, but very generous to themselves. Fifth point, Job claimed that a wicked person's punishment could be postponed and that a righteous person could die along with the wicked. 
to realize that the one who can give happiness and suffering was God. As Job was someone who experienced both in extreme measures, he was able to realize this. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgment is, and his paths beyond the tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Day 137, Job 22-24 Job's Experience of Poverty Hearing the word of Eliphaz, who regarded Job as one who made it a rule to do all kinds of evil, now Job only desired to meet God face to face. First point, Eliphaz started to list the faults of Job that he did not commit and claimed Job as a sinner. This was the last argument between Job and his friends. Eliphaz was the first to speak. To strengthen his argument, he started to add lies here and there. Eliphaz started to list the sins that Job had committed. We can see just how much he wanted to make his claim. Eliphaz claimed that Job would have committed the crimes that were made by wealthy people. But this was not true in the case of Job. Later, God rebuked Eliphaz on this matter. After the Lord had said these things to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Eliphaz had committed the crime of speaking falsely about one's neighbor. Second point, Eliphaz said that it was understandable why Job was being mocked. Eliphaz claimed that Job's suffering was due to God's righteousness. The righteous see their ruin and rejoice. The innocent mock them, saying, Surely our foes are destroyed, and fire devours their wealth. Eliphaz did not actually know about God's righteousness or providence. He just made claims based on his common knowledge. Eliphaz furthermore claimed that Job was an arrogant man, and that God favored those who were meek and humble. Eliphaz, who said the most hurtful words to his friend, really did not have the light to talk about humbleness. Third point, Job looked towards God who was silently observing. Job wanted to hear what God had to say rather than the hurtful words of his friends. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Job knew that the conversations with his friends were pointless. Job turned to God who was silent. Job earnestly waited for God and knew that God was his one and only hope. Fourth point, amidst his suffering, Job searched for God's providence. Job believed in God's providence, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth at gold. He knew that God would not give suffering to the righteous without any reason. He knew that trials, blessings, and the suffering all had a reason, and that God's providence ensured greater blessings in the end. Therefore, although he did not know why all this was happening to him now, he still turned to God and trusted in his providence. Fifth point, 
Job was able to experience the reality which he could not see when he was a wealthy man. Job was able to see the world from a poor and sick person's perspective. This was because God had enabled him to experience this. Through this, Job was able to confirm that God would perish the wicked, and so waited all the more for his trial. A righteous person lives every day through faith. A righteous person waits for God to save and do his work in his time. Let both grow together until the harvest. At the time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burnt. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Day 138, Job 25-31 Prosperous days seen from the days of poverty. Facing the blame of his friends who interpreted Job's suffering to be the matter of sin, Job hoped to hear God's judgment. First point, Bildad claimed until the end that Job's children died because of Job's sins. Bildad from chapter 8 consistently claimed that the reason Job's children died was because of Job's sins. Bildad's aim was to make Job admit his sins and also admit that the reason he was suffering was because of his sins. Bildad said that human life was like the life of insects. Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. How much less a mortal who is but a maggot, a human being who is only a worm? How then can a mortal be righteous before God? How can one born of a woman be pure? And then, on the other hand, Bildad said that because humans are God's creations, we resemble God. What Bildad failed to see was God's mercy for humans. If he saw this, then he would not have been able to say the hurtful things to Job. Bildad spoke as if he had no sins and then rebuked Job for all the things he had supposedly done wrong. Second point, Job told Bildad that his knowledge about God was too limited and subjective. To Bildad, who was so ignorant, Job used metaphors and other examples to fight back. To Bildad, who claimed that Job had sinned against God, Job argued back. How you have helped the powerless? How you have saved the arm that is feeble? What advice you have offered to one without wisdom? And what great insight you have displayed? Who has helped you utter these words? And whose spirit spoke from your mouth? Job asked whether Bildad had ever managed to persuade someone in the past. Job furthermore told him that his words were long and pointless. Job revealed his knowledge on God that Bildad did not know. And these are but the outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? But Job himself was far from understanding what God had planned from all this. Third point. Job claimed his righteousness and waited for God's judgment. It was very difficult for Job to listen to his stupid friends and missed his deep suffering. They made him lonelier. My lips will not say anything wicked, and my tongues will not utter lies. I will never admit you are in the light. Till I die, I will not deny my integrity. I will maintain my innocence and never let go of it. My conscience will not reproach me as long as I live. 
and so Job rebuked his friends for condemning him. May my enemy be like the wicked, my adversary like the unjust. For what hope have the godless when they are cut off, when God takes away their life? It is an earthly theory that God rewards the righteous and punishes the wicked. However, we should not come to abroad conclusions based on our temporary suffering. The wicked may seem to prosper in the short term, but God will have his justice in the long term. A wicked person will eventually perish and lose all their property. A wicked person will also be ridiculed. The reason Job was confidently able to say this was because he knew that he was not a sinner and that the true judge was God alone. Fourth point, Job reminisced about the past when God had blessed him. Job reminisced on the days when he was respected and his life was full of glory. Job was indeed a person who used to be respected. When I went to the gate of the city and took my seat in the public square, the young man saw me and stepped aside and the old man rose to their feet. He was among the elders to judge others and to lead the people. He was a wise man whom the people wanted to listen to. Job wanted to return to those days. Job was also a man who was kind to his neighbors and was consequently blessed because of his actions. Job was also a righteous man. I put unrighteousness as my clothing. Justice was my law and my tavern. God's blessing and the human mission is directly connected. Some people believe that if they act like Job, then God will bless them. Others believe that if God blesses them, then they could live a righteous life like Job. Satan wanted to test God on these issues. Skin for skin, Satan replied, a man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones and he will surely curse you to your face. Job was once an acknowledged leader, but his status had changed so drastically that now he pleaded to God. But no human has the right to complain to their Creator God. This is because God fundamentally wishes his creation peace and prosperity. Fifth point. Job spoke about his moral, social, and religious loneliness. Now Job started to say that if he had sinned, he did not have a problem with being punished. Job firstly said that he was morally righteous. Secondly, he claimed that he was socially righteous. He explained that he had looked after the weak and poor in society. He had acted in the way a person of God should act. Thirdly, he claimed that he was religiously righteous. With his closest friends condemning him, all Job could do was claim his righteousness to God. When he got to a point where he could no longer speak with his friends, Job honestly waited for God. He recalled how he had lived and now waited for God's judgment based on his life. Day 139, Job 32-37 Awaiting the days to stand before God The dialogue between Job and his friends that was drawing a parallel took a turn with Elias' remarks and prepared the way for God's words. First point, Job's other friend Elihu joined the argument. Now to jump into picture was Elihu who suddenly had a lot to say. Elihu not only condemned Job, but he also condemned Job's three friends. According to Elihu, 
the three friends did not get the point exactly and so had provided wrong interpretations. And now he started to speak of his own theory and interpretations. So these three men stopped answering Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. But Elihu, son of Barakel, the Bujaites of the family of Lam, became very angry with Job for justifying himself rather than God. He was also angry with the three friends because they had found no way to refute Job and yet had condemned him. Elihu spoke about God's wisdom and his sources on this matter. Elihu was the youngest in the group, but he claimed that his words were correct and that now it was his turn to tell them the real reason of Job's suffering. Second point, Elihu claimed that humans did not have a right to speak out to God the Creator. Elihu claimed that the three friends' theories were limited and that Job was suffering because of the result of his sin. He also criticized Job for calling himself righteous. His theory was that no human was without fault or limitations. To Elihu, Job was arrogant because he claimed himself as righteous in front of God. Elihu, similarly to the three friends, had no heart to console Job, but to condemn him all the more. Elihu lectured that Job had no right to speak out to God. Elihu claimed that Job was to silently receive his punishment from God. He furthermore stated that the issue of suffering could be explained through God's education. Elihu added that Job should only listen to his wise words. But Elihu was just an arrogant man who wanted to preach about wisdom. Third point, Elihu told Job that it was wrong of him to complain about his suffering. Elihu claimed that Job was wrong not to admit his faults. He said that even if Job did not sin, it was wrong of him to complain to God about his suffering. He now started to lecture on God's righteousness. So listen to me, you man of understanding. Far be it from God to the evil, from the Almighty to the law. He repays everyone for what they have done. He brings on them what their conduct deserves. It is unthinkable that God would do wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. But if he remains silent, who can condemn him? If he hides his face, who can see him? Yet he is over individual and nation alike to keep the godliness from ruling, from laying smash for the people. Job's actual interest was on why God was not responding to his suffering. Job could not stand that God was silent, but his friends were only interested in spelling out their theories and sorties and condemning Job. And now Elihu claimed that Job was indeed a sinner. Oh, that Job might be tested to the utmost for answering like a wicked man. Fourth point. Elihu advised to never stop praising God. Elihu's theory was that God is not influenced by human thoughts. If you sin, how does that affect him? If your sins are many, what does that do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him or what does he receive from your hand? He added that God does not hear the prayers of arrogant people and started to talk about how Job was an arrogant man. He advised Job to let go of his arrogance so that God may hear him. He then went on to talk about God's righteousness. God is mighty but despises no one. He is mighty and firm in his purpose. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. 
he does not take his eyes off the righteous. He enthrones them with the kings and exalts them forever. All Elihu was doing was adding to the existing pain and the suffering of Job. For the cherry on top, Elihu advised Job to never stop singing God's praises. Remember to extol his work, which people have praised in song. All humanity has seen it. Mortals gaze on it from afar. Fifth point. Elihu did not make any effort to feel Job's pain with him. Elihu's final speech continued. He spoke of God's providence that unfolds through nature. God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. He says to the snow, fall on the earth, and to the rain shower, be a mighty downpour. He brings the clouds to punish people or to water his earth and show his love. Elias' main theory was that God leads all things through nature, and as humans do not know the full extent of nature. It was our job to be humble and admit that we are limited. Elihu went on and on to talk about God's providence, wisdom, and how it was important not to be arrogant. Listen to this, Job. Stop and consider God's wonders. The Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power. In His justice and great righteousness, He does not oppress. Therefore, people revere him, for does he not have regard for all the wise in hearts? As Elihu said, indeed, humans cannot know the full extent of God's providence or depth. But Elihu failed in that he could not contribute a single positive outlook on Job's situation. Day 140, Job 38-42 Job, who became God's pride. In telling Job of his providence of governing the whole world, God showed himself to Job through Genesis chapter 1. First point, Job was the person to receive the most questions from God in the whole Bible. In the Bible, there are many questions. To look at a few, the first is God's question to Adam. But the Lord called to the man, Where are you? The second is Isaac's question to his father Abraham. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? The third is Moses' question to God. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? The first is Jesus' question to his disciples. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. The fifth is Peter's question to Jesus. When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? But in the whole Bible, God had the most questions for Job. In chapter 38, Job became bombarded with God's questions. Before then, Job had asked God countless questions based on causality. But now, God finally began speaking instead of answering Job's questions. God asked his own questions. Through God's questions, Job was able to fully realize that there was nothing he could do to answer or reply to God's questions. Second point, the questions God asked Job had its foundation in Genesis chapter 1. In God's creation, humans can experience the world through causality. That is why God asked Job all his questions based on Genesis chapter 1. With Genesis chapter 1 alone, we can see the greatness of God. 
Where were you when I laid the Earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand. Who shut up the sea behind the doors when it burst forth from the womb? Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hay? Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Who gives the ivy's wisdom or gives the rooster understanding? Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wonder about for lack of food? Through these questions, God wanted the job to find the answers himself. God knew all along that Job was amidst great suffering. God knew Job's suffering and God knows our suffering today. This is the consoling we can receive today. Third point. After God questioned the job, he expected answers. To God's bombarding questions, Job could not give a single reply. I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. So God said to Job, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? The fact that God appeared to Job alone was consoling for him. Job could not answer a single one of God's questions. Job concealed his mouth and knelt down. Indeed, Job was a man worthy of God's test. Fourth point, Job, who was considered a righteous man of the time, could not conceal his sins when standing before God. Job's suffering was a test by Satan that God had permitted. But now, Job confessed himself as a sinner before God. Job knew that even though he thought he had lived a righteous life, he was inevitably a sinner. This was inevitable for all humans. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You say, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Fifth point. Job transformed into God's heavenly treasure through his suffering. Through suffering, Job became heaven's precious treasure. Amidst the difficult suffering, Job turned to God until the end, and so was able to receive God's wisdom. Also, the fact that he did not end things with his friends was also a way for him to receive wisdom in the end. God forgave Job's friends on the ground that Job mediated for them through prayer, and they sought forgiveness through mediator sacrifice. As for Job's friends, they had to hear an earful for their stupidity. Job, who overcame Satan's test, now stood as God's precious treasure. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. As such, God tested his people to transform them into heavenly treasures. That is why we should not judge our or others' suffering. Day 141 Psalms 1 to 2 and 4 to 9. Song and Praise. Blessed is the man who lives according to the word of God, loves the word of God more than anything else, and meditates on it day and night. First point. Psalm chapter 1 
comprises the whole content of the Old Testament. In Psalm chapter 1, the psalmist sings of how blessed the life of the righteous is compared to the wicked. That is why those who read Psalms is blessed. Psalm chapter 1 emphasizes the importance of God's laws. Psalm chapter 1 is a prelude to the entire 150 Psalms and comprises the contents of the Old Testament through praise and worship. Second point, God governs the entire universe. Psalm chapter 2 is called the Psalm for a King. This is because it sings of God the King and how God as King governs the world. Similar content can be found in Psalms chapters 16, 22, 24, 45, 72, and 110. Psalm chapter 2 praises the wonders of having God as our King. The psalmist truly praises the fact that God is our King. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. We must live by enjoying God's laws and relying on God alone. Third point, David asked God the King to hear him. It is assumed that Psalms chapters 3, 4, and 5 were all written during the time of Absalom's coup d'etat. It is assumed that David wrote them whilst learning away from his son Absalom. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. David confessed that many around him enjoyed making false accusations and living without God. Some people even asked whether God actually exists. But David stood firm in his belief in God, offered the sacrifices of the righteous, and trust in the Lord. A righteous sacrifice contained not only the acts, but also the heart of the one making the offering. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart to you. God will not despise. David turned to God in the depths of his despair. In peace, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. David experienced countless circumstances of despair, but all throughout, he always turned to God for help. He knew that God was with him at all times. In Psalms chapters 4 and 5, David called God, My King, My God. Although David was learning away from his son, who wanted to take over his place, David was still the official king of Israel. But David called God his king and prayed to his king. Clearly, David knew that God was the ultimate king. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from the yoke of the Egyptians. Fourth point, David confessed that his bones and even his spirit were shaking. Among the 150 psalms, seven are musical pieces. These include Psalms 6, 32, 38, 39, 51, 130, and 143. Psalm chapter 6 was written by David, and here David knew that he had sinned and so repented most earnestly to God. David was shaking from the fear that God may leave him and desert him because of his sin. In Psalm chapter 7, David confessed that God is his refuge and furthermore praised God for his blessings. Fifth point, David praised God out loud who created all things, including humans. Psalms chapters 8 and 9 are David's worship poems. David sang to God 
for his creation and thanked God for all of his wonders. It is as if David wanted to thank God for his work in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? When God created humans, he molded us with clay and breathed life into our nostrils. How blessed are humans! David praised God for this wonder. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. Day 142, Psalms 10 to 18. Only God is my blessing. Since David had faith in God, he was able to entrust each moment of every day to him and not become impatient even when God was silent. First point, David confessed that God's words were like silver that had been refined seven times by the clay porter. Psalm chapter 11 is David's wisdom poem. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The righteous person that God spoke about was not someone without sin, but someone who confessed their sin. The reason David was able to live a life in front of God despite his many hardships was because he tried to live according to the way that God wanted. David said that a way to distribute between the righteous and the wicked was through the words that they spoke. We can tell who is wicked through the words that they say. A wicked boasts and rebukes God. David was distressed because of the wicked people around him. But the more the people around him said wicked things, the more he wanted to follow in God. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. We should praise God who stays and protects the weak until the end. Second point. David wrote about the person who could stand in God's dwelling place. David started his prayers in Psalm chapter 15 with, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? This was David telling himself to keep to his own question. David then went on to describe the person who had the right to stand in God's dwelling tent. The person was to be righteous, trustful, someone who did not rebuke or point out other people's flaws, someone who did not do evil to their neighbor, someone who feared God, someone who did not accept bribery, and someone who obeyed God and served their neighbors. These were all based on God's laws. Third point, David confessed that God was his ultimate blessing. David confessed that God was his ultimate and only blessing. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Amid his worst suffering, David prayed and praised God's salvation. 
David truly believed in the resurrection of the spirit. Later, Peter replied to David's confession. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Paul also made a reference to this, so it is also stated elsewhere. You will not let your Holy One see decay. David confessed, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my Lord secure. Someone who believes in God is able to confess that all that they possess belongs to God and has been given by God. That person could also confess that God is their porter and that they have been molded by God. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay. You are the porter. We are the work of your hand. With this faith, David was able to stay strong through all his distress. I will praise the Lord, who counsels me even at night. My heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him and my right hand, I will not be shaken. Fourth point, David confessed that he was most pleased being made in God's likeness. Psalm chapter 17 was written when David was being chased. Each time, David faced a dangerous and distressful situation. Instead of complaining, David called out to God and asked for God's salvation. David was a politician, a soldier, and a great king who led Israel to peace and prosperity. In Psalms, we can furthermore see how David was a man of earnest prayer. David was a king who lived to serve God and to reveal his righteousness and justice. David, who was born as a shepherd, left his name as the greatest king of Israel. David saw his enemies storing up goods for them and their children. At this, he said, By your hand, save me from such people, Lord, from those of this world whose reward is in this life. May what you have stored up for the wicked fill their bellies. May their children gorge themselves on it, and may there be leftovers for their little ones. David moreover confessed that he was storing up his goods in heaven. This reference was later used in the New Testament. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Fifth point, David truly confessed that he loved God. Psalm chapter 18 was written by David after he was anointed as king. He felt truly grateful to God and therefore sang his praises. Thus, it is beneficial to read this together with 2 Samuel chapter 22. David managed to turn his hardships into a song of praise to God. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord, who is worthy of praise and I have been saved from my enemies. David's life was far from peaceful or perfect. From his teen years, he endured countless hardships and dangerous situations. But all throughout his life, he always put God at the center, even when his life was at risk. Thus, David always had a strength in God. As for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's word is progress. He shoulders all who take refuge in Him. 
David had a few opportunities to kill Saul, but he never laid hands on his body. However, this meant that he had to spend a substantial amount of time learning away. It may appear that keeping the word of God is at times harmful, but David knew that it was the way of truth. David truly lived a life of believing in God at times of difficulty. Day 143, Psalms 19 to 27. The rose, sweeter than honey. In the circumstances where countless deep sighs were repeated, David always meditated on the word and prayed in order to keep the words of his lips, thought, and mind focused on God. First point. David confessed that God's rose, the Pentateuch, was sweeter than honey. David learned the content of the Pentateuch at a young age from his father. We remember that this is what Moses requested. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. David, who learned about the Pentateuch, confessed, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. In Psalm chapter 19, David glorified God whilst looking at his creation of the sky and the sun. He confessed that God's laws are perfect and that it governs his life. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour false speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. David, furthermore, in Psalm 19, verses 7 to 14, sang of the perfection of God's commandments and the benefits they have for humans. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servants also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord my Lord and my Redeemer. David had an honest wish. This was for his words and thoughts to be accepted by God. David realized that God's words are sweeter than honey. Thus, he was able to confess that the laws helped him live a life that was fulfilling and freeing. Second point, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was first said by David, and then by Jesus a thousand years later. Similarly to Job, David also cried to God when God was silent before his distress. However, David did not let his cries become a complaint. He knew that God would answer him in the end. This was repeatedly shown throughout David's lifetime. David sang praises to God and also for Jesus the Messiah who was to come. Psalm chapter 22 contains the content preceding Jesus' suffering. Psalm chapter 23 shows Jesus as the shepherd. And Psalm chapter 24 foretells about Jesus, the glorified King. As such, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? was used by Jesus a thousand years later. David cried out to God in deep lament. In this situation, David cried out, but no one heard him. The only one he could turn to was God. 
David knew that God would never disown him. And David prophesied, Jesus cried out the words a thousand years later when he was being nailed at the cross. Third point, David confessed that the Lord was his shepherd. The Bible contains many metaphors describing the relationship between God and the Israelites. Prophet Isaiah expressed God as the king. Prophet Hosea called God father. And Prophet Ezekiel called God the husband. David referred to God as his rock, his shelter, and his refuge in Psalms. But the main reference that David made was God as his shepherd. David himself used to be a shepherd, and he knew just how much effort the shepherd made to look after his sheep. Thus, David called God his shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. During his teens, David looked after his father's sheep. He fought against a bear and a lion to protect his father's sheep. David confessed that God looked after him as if he was the sheep and God the shepherd. David sang that God was with him through all situations, no matter how difficult. A sheep does not need to fear so long as it is guided by the shepherd. The shepherd and the staff guide the sheep to ensure their safety. Thus, the staff that guides can be seen as God's love. God sometimes furnishes with his staff because he loves us. Fourth point, David confessed that God, his king, is the God of glory. In Psalm chapter 24, David sings of God the Messiah, who is the God of glory. This was written during the time when David ordered for the ark to be moved to Jerusalem. Lift up your hands, you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your hands, you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. There was a time that Israel had lost the ark to the Philistines. The ark had moved around here to there for a long time. And so David was overjoyed at the thought of it being moved to Jerusalem. David wanted the entire Israel to be filled with joy. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a fool's God. The person who stands in front of God must have the heart to listen to God's words. Before we go to worship, God expects us to come in holiness. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Fifth point, David confessed that he waits for God all day. Psalm chapter 25 was written in the order of the Hebrew alphabet called Acrostic Poem. This kind of poem was written in Psalms 25, 34, and 119 and also by Jeremiah in Lamentations. Psalm chapter 25 was written by David asking God to save him from his enemies. David stood before God and confessed that he was a sinner and asked God for his forgiveness. One must ask for God's forgiveness before asking for his mercy and salvation. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. 
relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. The reason David managed to stay as God's servant until the very end was because he always had the heart to repent. This pleased God enormously. Day 144, Psalms 28 to 33. Anger is temporary, grace is forever. David always experienced God in his life, who was a true protector and refuge, and put this assurance and faith in his songs. First point David asked God to hear his cry. David likely prayed the same prayer in Psalm 28 many times. To you, Lord, I call. You are my rock. Do not turn a deaf ear to me. For if you remain silent, I will be like those who go down to the pit. As David prayed, he cried out in distress, with his enemies constantly trying to bring him down. He cried out in lament and spent many moments in prayer. David managed to keep the country in peace as he always looked to God in difficult situations. Hear my cry for mercy as I call to you for help, as I lift up my hands toward your most holy place. David prayed that he knew the wicked would eventually receive their punishment and that God would make sure that justice is done. Do not drag me away with the wicked, with those who do evil, who speak cordially with their neighbors, but have a malice in their hearts. They pay them for their deeds and for their evil work. They pay them for what their hands have done and bring back on them what they deserve. They claimed that the characteristic of the wicked is that they lie. Also, they have a hate in their hearts. David cried out to God to punish such people. David also sang for the righteous people. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Second point. David sang that God's anger is temporary and his grace is forever. In Psalm chapter 30, David said, Lord, ten times. David wished to sing praise to God who protected him at all times. David relied on God no matter his circumstances. David confessed that God made his sadness into dance and his sacrosis disappear with his mercy. David sang that God always brought joy to him and that he was grateful for God's wisdom. There was one point when David made God angry through his arrogance, but David confessed that God's anger is temporary and his grace is forever. We must remember that God sometimes disciplines us, but this is an act of his great love. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father, the son he delights in. David is son of God's grace and mercy. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord my God, I will praise you forever. Third point, David confessed that his days are in the hands of God. David confessed that God's anger was nothing compared to his great grace. David encouraged the people to trust in God who delivers them from evil and always gives courage and wisdom. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. In the most desperate situation, 
David prayed to God to ask for help. He prayed to God to deliver him from the hands of his enemies. During such circumstances, David sang that his life and spirit are in God's hands. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. This was David confessing that his life was God's. Later, Stephen referred to David's prayer. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Fourth point, David sang that the one who receives forgiveness for their faults is blessed. David referred to faults and sins in Psalm chapter 32. David said that if he opened his mouth, then all he could do was mourn. However, there is a hope for those who confess their sins and faults to God. God will bless them and forgive those people. David wrote this after committing the sin of killing Uriah. David wrote of his repentance and how he was grateful for forgiveness. David advised that no matter how embarrassing one's fault is, it was important to repent to God. David himself repented with tears, so God forgave him. Through this, David was able to return to God. Fifth point, God makes people's ideologies poetry. The writer of Psalm chapter 33 is anonymous, but some believe that it was written by David. The psalmist sang whilst remembering how God protected them through their life. The psalmist praised God and wished to glorify God. The right had experienced life in the army and days of hunger. He wrote that through all this, God helped him, and that he was able to find peace and hope in God. God does not neglect or forget about his people. God is righteous, trustful, just, and full of grace. God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. God looks after all human beings and grants them salvation. God is the God of salvation and mercy. Day 145, Psalm 35 to 41. Do not envy those who do wicked. Since David trusted God's righteous judgment, David was able to stand up again by holding on to the expectation that the evil's tormenting will not last forever. First point, David pleaded to God to fight against those who are fighting with him. Psalm chapter 35 was written when David was learning away from Saul. David said to God that although Saul continually threatened his life and he was in danger, he would never make plans to take revenge or attack Saul. This was because David respected God's anointment of Saul in a kingdom of priests. David made this request to God, Contend, Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take up shield and armor. Arise and come to my aid. Brandish spear and javelin against those who pursue me. Say to me, I am your salvation. May those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. Even in the midst of unbearable distress, David turned to God and prayed to him. Rather than praying for revenge, David prayed for justice to be done by God. David left his enemies in God's hands. David knew how to distinguish between his role and God's role. Even while he was being unfairly chased, he knew that it was not his place to attack. Lord, you have seen this. Do not be silent. Do not be far from me, Lord. 
awake and rise to my defense. Contend for me, my God and Lord. Vindicate me in your righteousness, Lord my God. Do not let them gloat over me. David had the faith that it was only God who could judge this situation. Second point, David warned not to envy those who prospered while doing evil. Despite being unfairly chased, David did not complain about his situation. He rather waited for God's fair judgment. David said, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. He was telling himself not to complain even when things turned bad. This was one of David's characteristics all throughout his life. David could have complained that his circumstances were indeed terrible. However, he asked for God's help and pleaded with God to help him in his distress. David believed in God's justice. Regarding the wicked, David wrote, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret in leaders only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Repaying evil with evil is not God's method. God's people must wait for God's trial and wait for justice to be done. One who is able to wait will win God's prize. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with God. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Third point, David claimed that life was as short as the palm of his hand. In Psalm chapter 39, David claimed that he will hold his tongue in front of his enemies and also have his hope in God alone. David believed that trials belonged to God and that he was to act with faith. I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth while in the presence of the wicked. So I remained utterly silent, not even saying anything good. But my anguish increased. My heart grew hot with me. While I meditated, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made my day a mere handed breath. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath, even those who seem secure. Surely everyone goes around like a mere phantom. In vain they rush about, heaping up wealth without knowing whose it will finally be. David had five reflections regarding life. The first was that life was as short as a hand breath. The second was that the span of one's years is as nothing before God. The third was that even the times of standing firm were all in vain. The fourth was that life was like a shadow. The fifth was that people made even the worthless things a big deal. And so David confessed, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Moses, who also walked with God, confessed, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that had just gone by. 
or like a watch in the night. Fourth point, David praised God for raising him out of the deepest pit. In Psalm chapter 40, David waits for God with the confirmation that he will not give up on him. David was able to confess this as he had experienced God raising him out of a pit previously. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in Him. Even in circumstances of despair, David did not give up or lament. And so he was able to experience the wonders of God in such situations. David was able to experience this multiple times. David praised God for granting him blessings and miracles all throughout his life and confessed that he could not count the times God helped him in times of distress. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. For I to speak and tell of your deeds. They would be too many to declare. Fifth point, David told God that even his closest friends were against him. In Psalm chapter 41, David told God that even his closest friends pointed their swords against him. An example was David's counselor Ahithophel, who used to be his friend. Now he was his enemy, and David poured out his heart to God. All my enemies whispered together against me. They imagined the worst for me, saying, A vile disease has afflicted him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, had turned against me. David pleaded most sincerely for God's help. Despite such circumstances, David did not plan a life of revenge, but instead tried to live with them. He practiced this with Saul and his family. Like Moses, David also tried his best not to live a life fueled or motivated by revenge. Jesus also had a similar approach when it came to Judas Iscariot. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Day 146, Psalms 42 to 50 and 53. God who helps at dawn. Since God is our refuge, power, and help, and His children, we can enjoy unshaken peace, even in the middle of everything else being shaken. First point, the psalmist advises for us to have hope in God at all times. Psalms chapter 42 is the psalm from the descendant of Korah and he confessed that he missed God's temple and because his soul was downcast, he all the more turned to God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. Psalms 42 and 43 are open seen together. The psalmist told himself to not be worried or downcast and keep his hope in God. Whilst he was away from Jerusalem, he confessed that he missed God's temple and also sang of how much he adored it. The psalmist had spent the day crying from hearing people saying that there was no God. But he pulled himself together and said that he should turn to God, 
all the more in such cases. The psalmist referred to himself as a deer that searches for a stream and that God is the stream. The psalmist continues to remember God in Psalm 44 and confesses that God has been with Israel through thick and thin. He asks for God's help whilst saying that they did not forget him and they kept to God's laws. Second point, the psalmist expresses that Jesus, who was to come as Messiah, had lips anointed with grace. Psalms 45 sings of the Messiah and the King of Kings. The psalmist expresses that the Messiah was like the groom and Israel was like the bride, and the coming of the groom was like a wedding in heaven. The king referred to here was worthy of God's blessing. And thus, the psalmist sang of the king's praise and loyalty to him. Psalm 45 can be seen as a song of love and a song of blessing. Among the 150 psalms, Psalms 45 is the only one that has been called a wedding song. The psalmist goes on to proclaim that he would praise and remember God our King. He furthermore sings a song of love which has been expressed like a wedding song. You are the most excellent of men, and your ribs have been anointed with grace, since God has blessed you forever. Psalm 45 and the whole sings of the Messiah. The Messiah song about here is the most excellent of men and has lips anointed with grace. We all wait for the groom Jesus Christ with bated breath. Third point, the psalmist waits for dawn and prays that God will help them at dawn. Psalm 46 was written by the descendants of Korah. It was written when Assyria attacked Jerusalem during the times of King Hezekiah and when the Israelites were victorious. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roll and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. As the psalmist confesses, we too should confess that God is with us and leads us through the strongest storm and deepest despair. The psalmist had the absolute faith that God is his refuge, shelter, and lock, and that God is incomparably stronger than any of the problems we come across. Therefore, wherever God leads us is the place of safety and shelter. Psalm 46 was written when God delivered the people of Israel from the hands of Assyria by killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers overnight. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death. 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up, the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. God is our true refuge and shelter. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? First point, the psalmist praises the Lord and says, that everyone should clap their hands and sing to God. Psalm 47 was written by the descendant of Korah, and it prophesies about the coming of the Messiah. The psalmist praises the one and only ruler God. He claims that God is the only one worthy of ultimate praises. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. 
For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King of all the earth. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. The psalmist proclaims that God is not only the God of Israel, but the God of all nations, and that he governs the entire universe. Psalm 47 also writes about the coming of the Messiah. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Fifth point, Asaph tells those who forgot God to remember God. The way God calls the universe is incredible in scope. God calls the place where the sun dawns and the sun set. The mighty one God the Lord speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to where it set. God shines light for those who call him, and he expects his people to stand righteous before him. This is because we are God's precious people. Psalm 50 is called Asab's wisdom poem, and in this poem, he calls those who have forgot God to come back and remember him. Asab states that God judges of all, and especially his people. A person who only memorizes the laws without a heart to worship cannot give God true pride. Only one who has the full heart facing God can offer true worship. Consider this, you who forget God, or I will tear you to pieces with no one to rescue you. Those who sacrifice thank offerings honor me, and to the blameless I will show my salvation. Day 147, Psalms 55 to 56, 58, and 60 to 66. Pour my tears into your bottle, God. God is close enough to listen to prayers of the righteous who trust Him and rely on His justice. First point, David advises to give everything one has to God. Psalm 55 was written by David during his chase from Absalom's coup d'etat. Ahithophel had turned against him and was on Absalom's side, and it is truly added to David's lament. Although David was surrounded by enemies and threat, he still turned to God and asked God to hear his prayer. We can truly sense just how much David relied on God during all times. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The blood thirst and the deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. Now David had been told that Hidobel is among the conspirators with Absalom. So David prayed, Lord, turn Ahitobel's counsel into foolishness. David's actual state of mind was full of fear, anxiety, and horror. Nevertheless, he still prayed to God and expressed his trust in him. David described God who listened to his prayer. David was able to describe God so vividly, and we can moreover see just how intimate David stood before God. To those who were experiencing something similar to David, he advised them to leave all their worries with God. In other words, David was telling them that God has mercy on those who give him their trust fully. Second point, David asked God to list his tears in God's scroll. Psalm 56 was written when David was captured by the Philistines. David sang praise to God, thanking him despite the fact that he was chased by Saul all day long. 
And even after he had to save his own life, when the king of the Philistines recognized him, David confessed that God was with him. Be merciful to me, my God, for my enemies are in hot pursuit. All day long, they press their attack. These difficult situations made David seek God all the more. David grew closer to God in times of despair and distress. We can see just how much David yearned for God during hardship. David prayed to God to list his tears in God's scroll and for God to remember him. David was full of great pleas to God for always being with him. Third point, David advised to pour out your heart to God. In Psalm 62, David proclaims that one should always turn to God even when they are faced with the worst situation. David further confesses that God is full of mercy and love and that he himself is able to find strength in this. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. David confessed that he wanted his actions to be only for God. In Psalms 62, David asked God to let others know of his circumstances. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. David was someone who always turned to God and also found strength in God. God wants us to do the same. David advised this, and he was able to find true happiness from doing so himself. Fourth point, David sang that God's grace was better than life. Psalm 63 was written when David was learning away from Absalom's coup d'etat, and he arrived in the desert of Judah. David sang that his spirit seeks God and that his body praises God. You, God, are my God. Honestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Whilst he was learning to save his own life, David stood before God with a more earnest heart. David's life was a repetition of such hardship. He endured hardship at a young age and thereafter. In the desert, David prayed to God as he always did throughout his life. We also live as if walking through an endless desert sometimes. But even so, we can pray like David. This is because God is with us even during the hardest times. I will be fully satisfied and with the richest of foods, with singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my half, I sing in the shadow of your wings. Psalm 64 was also written by David with a heart to obey and follow God all the more. They fought injustice and say, we have devised a perfect plan. Surely the human mind and heart are cunning. But God will shoot them with his arrows. They will suddenly be struck down. David was surrounded by wicked people. These people were scheming on ways to kill him. God judged these people. The righteous will rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. All the upright in heart will glory in him. Fifth point, David sang that all those who live in God's dwelling are blessed. Psalm 65 was David's proclamation of faith, and he confessed that his load was too heavy for him to bear. In the middle of this, David sang to God, who created the mountains and the seas. 
Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. Day 148, Psalms 67-72 Offering praise and bulls. When we give thanks and glory to God, who is the source of all blessings, we are able to enjoy the grace of eternal salvation and heavenly blessings on earth. First point. David sang that God is the father to the orphans and the righteous judge to the widows. Psalm 68 is a song of praise, and David sings of God who meets with his people and governs the world and makes justice. David furthermore sings of God who fights for people and gives humans strength. God commands us to look after the weak in society and that his heart is always facing them. Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do, and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. Strong people can look after themselves without the help from others, but the weak need protection. God especially mentions the orphans, the widows, and the foreigners. A father to the fatherless, a dependent of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. Second point, David sang that God is more pleased with a true song than offering a bull. Psalm 69 forewarns about the suffering of the Messiah and also relates this to his own situation of suffering. David had almost faith that even in such a situation, God was listening to his prayer and with him. And so David praised God all the more and claimed that he was able to be wiser and brave through his faith in God. David waited for his enemies to fall. David knew that no one could make his face fall. God's people put their hearts into persuading them to listen to God. Often, this made them victims of ridicule and mockery, but this did not stop them from delivering the message of God. They were able to go on through faith in God. Psalm 69 records the suffering of the Messiah. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. Jesus later referred to this, but this is to fulfill what is written in their law. They hated me without reason. Also, David is psalm about giving wine during time of thirsty was connected to Jesus' cross. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gold. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Third point, David pleaded to God to help him quickly. In Psalm 70, David called out to all those who called for God, and this included himself. David claimed that God would not forget those who called for him in the midst of suffering, illness, or distress. Psalm 70 contains the same content as Psalm 40, verses 13 to 17. David called out to God and asked him to be with him and to help him. David knew that all things were possible for him through God. Fourth point, David sang how God would be with him until he was an old man. In Psalm 71, David prayed to God not to leave him as he grew older. David also prayed that he would rely not on humans but on God all the more as he aged. As one grows older, as they think more about death than their future, it becomes difficult to have hope. 
For such times, David prayed to God for hope. David confessed that God was his refuge and shelter all throughout his life. David prayed that he will spend the rest of his life praying and praising God and also telling the generations to come about God's salvation and blessing. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God. Till I declare your power to the next generation, your might acts to all who are to come. As David grew older, he did not simply give in to his old age, but later turned to God and consequently lived a blessed life. God's focus is always towards one soul, but humans consistently change their focus. This was the promise God gave through prophet Isaiah. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am here. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. Fifth point, Solomon hoped that he would be a righteous judge for God's people. In Psalm 72, Solomon asked God for wisdom and also sang of the coming Messiah. And though the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness, may he judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. May the mountains bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. Israel, who had their foundation in a kingdom of priests, served God as their king. They had the mission to fill their hearts with God and to practice holiness. David was able to practice justice and righteousness by doing so. Solomon therefore prayed to God for God's wise judgment and also God's righteousness. Day 149, Psalms 73 to 78. Realization when entering the temple. Remembering the great and wonderful things God did in history holds unto us firmly so that our trust in God may not be shaken under any circumstances. First point. Asap sang for even the wicked to be able to realize their sins when entering the holy place. Psalm 73 is Asaph's wisdom poem. Here, Asaph confirmed that the wise would be acknowledged by God and the wicked would perish. He moreover advised that the true life of wisdom is believing in God. The psalmist confessed that he could not stand that the wicked were prospering. He also added that that it was such a shame that there are people envious of the wicked prospering. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. But the psalmist was able to experience God's blessing when he went to the holy place in the temple. As he walked into the temple, he was able to see the end of the wicked, and thus confess that he had complete faith in God. I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. If one discovers the heart of God, they will understand that the wicked will not last, as the Levites valued their life of serving God more than having their own lands. The psalmist also confessed that he was satisfied and overjoyed in God alone. Second point, Asa proclaimed that God is the decider of boundaries and territories. It is assumed that Psalm 74 was written by Asa during the time Jerusalem fell in the hands of the Babylonian Empire. The psalmist asks God how he could abandon them and calls out to him. The psalmist moreover asks God to remember the covenant he made 
with the people of Israel. The psalmist asks us why God abandoned them and told God of the state of Jerusalem. He cried that the temple was burned down and all that was left were ashes from the flames. The psalmist prayed to God to remember them and their mission. There is nothing worse than the feeling of being helpless. But we must remember that those are the times we can pray. When prayer is lost, that is when all things become lost. Third point, as have claimed that God our judge raises us at times and also hungers us. Psalm 75 is predicted to have been written during the time the king of Assyria came to attack Jerusalem. Asap compares the righteous and the foolish. The righteous turns to God during the time of despair, whereas the foolish claimed that there is no God. The righteous, therefore, are blessed, whereas the foolish perish. This psalm can be a summary of what happens to the foolish as a result of their wicked behavior. The psalmist writes that God has a decided plan for them and that he will judge at his time. God will make the wicked fall and they will experience God's punishment no matter what. God will eventually perish all the wicked. The psalmist therefore claims that he can only praise God. The righteous God judges people. God governs the entire universe and judges at his appointed time. Where the God's creations must wait for God's time. Fourth point, Asaph praised God and said that he would remember God's right hand. Asaph in Psalm 77 confesses that God's salvation does not change, but humans think that it changes because they lack faith. The psalmist therefore praises God and his great power, as well as confessing his own limitations and weaknesses. The reference to God's right hand in the Bible carries a unique meaning. It means that God intervenes with his salvation. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. Alternatively, if God does not stretch out his right hand, then real despair begins. The psalmist prays to God about this all throughout the night. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and I would not be comforted. Amidst his suffering, the psalmist worries that God has left him and that he fears that God will no longer grant him mercy or forgiveness. The psalmist prays to God not to leave him and tells God that he will not forget God's blessings to him thus far. Fifth point, Asaph remembered Exodus and the history of the desert life through praise. Asaph's wisdom poems include Psalm 78 along with Psalms 105, 106, and 135. Psalm 78 is a history poem by Asaph. The psalmist repents of the time because people disobeyed him in the desert following Exodus. Indeed, the people complained about no water, no meat, and also that it was impossible to conquer Canaan. The sins of the people that the psalmist refers to are firstly that they forgot what the Lord had done for them. The second is that the people questioned God. The third is that the people served God only on the surface. The fourth is that they worshipped the idols. The psalmist praises God who still forgave and was with his ancestors despite all their sins. He did miracles in the sight of their ancestors, in the land of Egypt, in the region of John. He split the locusts in the wilderness and gave them water 
as abundant as the seas. But he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved. He built his sanctuary like the height, like the earth that he established forever. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. The point of this psalm is crystal clear. It is that the descendants must have faith in only God. The descendants must be different to their ancestors who did not obey God. The psalmist sings of God who chose David among the tribe of Judah to rule over the kingdom by focusing on God. Day 150, Psalms 79-85 to Right from God's face, desiring to live in the tabernacle where God was present, the psalmist sang that one day in the Lord's palace was better than a thousand days elsewhere. First point, in Psalm 80, Asap referred to three important images. Psalm 80 is estimated to have been written by Asap during the time when North Israel was collapsing. The psalmist prays to God using three important images. They were a shepherd and a lamb, a king and the people, and the farmer and the vineyard. Asap wanted to appeal to God that God and the Israelites could not be separated by using these three images. He asks God not to hide his face in circumstances of distress. As such, the psalmist prayed to God three times to show his face, and this was because he was so earnest for salvation. In fact, God had systematized the Israelites to live with God's blessing. Thus, God gave them the covenant of a kingdom of priests as well as promising them that God will show His grace when they asked. As we cannot imagine sheep without their shepherd or a vineyard without the farmer, it is difficult to imagine a people without their king. When we ask God to show His face, He will do so to provide us with salvation. A second point, Asa praised God and sang that they would blow the horns during the festivals. In Psalm 81, Asa praises God for bringing the Israelites out from Egypt. I removed the burden from their shoulders. Their hands were set free from the basket. Asaph wrote that the Israelites would no longer neglect or forget God and remember Him and also keep the three annual festivals. This psalm was a reminder of the three festivals as well as remembering the time God was with them all throughout their desert life. The psalmist claims that seeking God and listening to His laws gives us strength. He also confesses that those who do not listen to God's laws or keep his festivals should be punished. God wanted the people to always live as holy citizens in the kingdom of priests and remember what he did for them. Hence, God told the people to remember their covenant. God promised that if they remembered this covenant, he would bless their children and fill their lives with his grace. Third point, Asaph sang for all people to come to know God, the Creator. Psalm 84 is estimated to have been written by Asaph during the reign of King Jehoshaphat. And when South Judah was being attacked by Edom and other countries, God is not only the king of the Israelites, but king of the entire world. And so the psalmist sang that he wished for the world to know and praise God. The Old Testament is recorded focusing on the history of the Israelites. But through the book of the prophets, we can understand that God's focus has always been on the whole world. 
the psalmist therefore understood that the surrounding countries were not just enemies. The psalmist tried to pray from God's perspective. Fourth point, the psalmist sang that it is better to be in God's presence for one day than a thousand days elsewhere. Psalm 84 was written by the descendant of Korah, and here the psalmist turns to God and refers to a palace. This referred to God's presence. Among the Psalms, Psalm 84 is used the most for song. It contains the heart of adoring God's temple. The psalmist sings of a blessed life. He says that one who looks to God and centers his life on where God's presence resides has a blessed life. If one loves God, then they cannot help loving the temple. The psalmist therefore sings of his deep adoration for the temple. In Psalms 42 and 43, the psalmist uses the metaphor of a deer looking for the stream to express his yearning for God. The psalmist in Psalm 84 also deeply yearns for God. The yearning was so sincere that he was out of energy. The psalmist sang that it is better to be in God's presence for one day than a thousand days elsewhere. This applies to us, we are the happiest when we stand in God's presence. Fifth point, the psalmist sang for the captives to be able to return through God's grace. It is assumed that Psalm 85 was written by the descendant of Korah after the first group of captives returned from Babylon. The psalmist asks God to stop his fury and then remembers the days God blessed Israel. He prays to God for God's salvation and blessing once again. The psalmist expresses his deep love for God. He expresses his love for God who allowed the captives to return from Babylon. It was not Israel who loved God, but God who loved Israel. And so, if the Israelites were able to keep their hearts facing God, then they would be able to keep their peace. Day 151, Psalms 86 to 89, calling for God with both hands up. God helps and comforts those who follow the Lord's way with a humble and whole heart. First point, David sang to God to forgive his sins. In Psalm 86, David prays to God to teach him God's way. Even in the circumstances of poverty, hunger, and threat from the enemy, David says that he wishes to put his whole heart in glorifying God. David was a someone who relied on God all throughout his life amid his highs and lows. Even God's people go through periods of doubt. Just because someone has a strong faith does not mean that their energies are always soaring high. These people try hard to consistently keep their faith even in times of hardship. We should always keep our faith in God even in times of doubt. In Psalm 86, David writes Lord multiple times. This was David acknowledging God as his master and himself as God's servant. David called himself God's servant and tried to deepen his relationship with God all the more. Second point, the psalmist sang of Mount Zion in Jerusalem. Psalm 87 was written by the descendant of Korah. And the psalmist praises God in Jerusalem where his presence dwells. The reason for singing in Jerusalem was because that was where God's laws were proclaimed. Because God dwelled on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, that was the most beautiful place on earth. It was a safe place where God ruled. Thus, 
The psalmist claimed that Mount Zion was a blessed place. The psalmist repeats that there it was proclaimed three times. It emphasizes how Zion became the center of faith with surrounding countries such as Egypt, Babylon, Philistine, Tyre, and so on. This puts into perspective that although each person belongs to their own respective nations, they are all collectively God's people in faith. Even though Egypt and Babylon had been long-standing enemies of Israel, they were still able to call one another God's people, the people of Zion. Third point, the psalmist called God with his hands clasped together every day. Psalm 88 was written by Heman the Edrite. The psalmist expressed his great distress. The psalmist prayed to God to hear his prayer, and he put his hands together to listen to God every day. The psalmist said, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night, I cry out to you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you, but I cry to you for help. Lord, in the morning, my prayer comes before you. The psalmist was surrounded by darkness. This reminds us of Job. But even during his suffering, the psalmist still held on to prayer. He had a faith that God listened to his prayer. The psalmist may have wanted to give up countless times a day, but he still tried to find hope in God by praying. Fourth point, the psalmist sang of the covenant God made with David. Psalm 89 was written by Ethan the Ezraite, who sang that God called David to be his servant. This relationship was not simply one of a master and a servant, but a relationship of love. The psalmist furthermore expresses this as the relationship of a father and son. God's grace and sovereignty is a recurring theme of the Old Testament. The reason the Israelites were able to receive forgiveness for their sins and have faith during the times of national crisis was all because of God's grace. The psalmist uses the covenant God made with David as the main theme of his poem. He focuses on God and writes that it was not because of David's greatness, but because of God's greatness that this covenant was made. Fifth point. The psalmist asked God to remember the covenant he made with David and to save Israel. Lord, where is your former great love, which in your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, Lord, how your servant has been mocked, how I bear in my heart the taunt of all the nations. The psalmist prays to God, to remember the covenant he made with David so that he could save Israel. The psalmist hopes for God to restore Israel to its blessed days. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a love wielded by men, with the floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love will never be taken away from me as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. As such, the psalmist prays to God to remember Israel and to save them. 